Hello everybody and welcome to another edition of Magic Mics, proudly sponsored by CoolSomething.com, Mana Traders, as well as Twitch subs and Patreon supporters just like you. My name is Evan Irwin, and we start each week by saying hello to my two co-hosts, Power Dragon. What's up everybody? And I have to tell you, you might be listening to the latest hype man for Thunder Junction right now. A lot of us, honestly. Ruben Bressler. <laughs> Howdy y'all, how y'all doing? He's He's got his mug and he's got his hat, his cowboy yeah, hat, here. if you're listening. The man's got the the extras. I'm um, I'm ready to do the whole show with this accent. Oh, wait till oh, you see what don't. I'm posting right <laughs> after this show is done. Like, oh yeah, what's that? On socials because there's a fun video coming. Oh okay, nice. <laughs> all right. Looking well, if you if you missed our pre-show, the early viewers got all of that this evening. Patrons and subs to this channel get access to that stuff early, and we kick it off uh, with our code push for CoolStuffInc.com using the promo code Magic Mics. Now, we were talking about this a little pre-show. You know, uh, there weren't the greatest Magic the Gathering products released this year, per se. I, I like Fallout was cool, but again, mostly talking about MKM. So use promo code Magic Mics to get 5% off the sweet OTJ stuff we're going to talk about, the Outlaw stuff, the Outlaw special guests, the big bonus sheet thing, all that. Uh, and it's super important because the future of this show relies on our sponsorship and our patron support. So thank you so very much for all those who do. Uh, if you can't support us, please let the world know that we exist. Uh, give us a review on the iTunes. And uh, any way you could use, again, promo code Magic Mics uh, at CoolStuffing.com. Save 5%. Go, go, go. Uh, all right. And. We will support our favorite streamer, your favorite streamer, with your suggestions in the show to see who we raid tonight. And that's CoolStuffing.com, where you can find cool stuff in stock. And then we're going to talk about uh, Outlaws of Thunder Junction previews, because there's a lot of them. This set is very large. I think, honestly, one of the uh, leg-ups that it has sort of by default is there's so many cards in it. Like, there's a Dude, lot. Dude, I'm literally that. Like, I normally we're about done with previews. And, like, every day I'm like, why are there 10 more bangers I got to talk about today? <laughs> like, <laughs> seriously. Yeah, the, uh, the set is pretty impressive. And so what we decided to do this evening was to talk about two new cards and then one reprint. Because there's some seriously impactful, impressive reprints uh, that are coming our way. And Ruben is up first. Tell, tell us what you want to talk about first. Well, hell, there's a bunch of good reprints in this set. Uh, do you want me to talk about the reprints or you want to talk about the new cards? Uh, the new cards and the list, the order that you have. Got it. Okay. Well, there's a there's a bunch of really cool things happening in this set. Really interesting way uh, to fix a limited issue, which is mercenaries. Mm. Um, one of the issues with having a tribal uh, archetype in a limited format is oftentimes you just don't have enough of one tribe to make it really function. So they've done things in the past like changelings and party to try to mitigate that issue. And the latest attempt here is uh, outlaws uh, in Outlaws of Thunder Junction. The outlaw creature types are mercenaries, pirates, rogues, warlocks, and assassins. And so you can print five times as many outlaws as you would normally get in a traditional... Uh, tribal. And mm -hmm. so with that, you get a lot of interesting interactions with outlaws. And because it's a tribal interaction, we get a new card that is a two mana doom blade to X out some of those things. So very along the lines of things like victim of night, walk the plank, uh, but shoot the sheriff is the card that I'm going to talk about. And it favors, uh, um, positively with a card called go for the throat which might be better than any of them so shoot the sheriff is a generic and a black instant destroy target non-outlaw creature it's a bunch of stuff i want to talk about about this card the first thing is the card's called shoot the sheriff the flavor text says now where is that deputy all right we yeah, did it. yeah we did it with the, <laughs> we uh, did it with who shot the we sheriff definitely did it with the flavor text we definitely did it with the rules text Let's talk about the reminder text first, mm. though. Assassins, mercenaries, pirates, rogues, and warlocks are outlaws. Everyone else is fair game. What a great piece of reminder text. That joins the land continues to burn. It does. Uh, in all-time reminder text updates. Mm. Um, and the reason why it was inserted like this, as, as we're told, is because they wanted it to not be a double negative as reminder text of, like, 
those are like nothing else is not targetable mm, or something like that. I got you. So the yeah. sentence "everything else is fair game" is a positive way to say the 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 you can't do can't do a thing. Hmm. And it, that's an it's interesting idea. I hadn't realized that. That's cool. yeah. So it, it has a linguistic purpose in addition to being adorable. Yeah, I'm into it. I think this is especially like you're saying in a limited environment. You know, now you will have the thing of. Random cards, maybe like a mercenary or whatever. But yeah, I think it's cool having these types of two mana removal. I think this is kind of like a staple thing we get almost every other set now, some variant. So like, yeah, this is a good one. Yeah, Don't have any I, issues with it. Right. I think what we found was, you know, particularly over time historically, that Wizards has a tough time uh, with tribal sets if you don't have enough tries, if you can't get that web, you know, or that, you know, that, that net wide enough. Um, and shoot the sheriff. Awesome. Uh, the fact that we have Sheriff of Safe Passage. Cool. I don't still, I still don't feel like there's sheriffs in the set. I don't, I don't feel like there's law and there's the law. There's not enough law. There's not jails. You know what I mean? Now like, that we've, we've seen, seen the whole set. Now that we've seen the full picture, I agree with you that there isn't enough law. There's not enough law and order like stuff type stuff because that's, that's, that's part of the tension. That's part of the tension of your frontier fantasy is that there's outlaws because there's people who are chasing the outlaws and no one's really chasing the outlaw. In fact, this is like a bad guy shooting another bad guy for all intents and purposes in terms of, you know, a dark, you know, guy versus shooting another dark guy in the darkness or whatever. But again, in terms of mechanically, I love it. I think this is great design. I love it when they do this stuff. Like it's not as good in limited, but it'd be way much better in constructed, which I think is awesome. Significantly better in constructed. Uh, the stats that I saw that uh, it kills 19 of the 20 most popular cards, creatures mm -hmm. in commander, go for the throat kills the same number. Nice. So it favors comparably to an all-star that's been around for a decade plus. And that is definitely an all-star. Uh, so yeah, that card is super duper dope all regardless. And again, everyone else's fair game is just like, that was brilliant. Uh, what's your next card? Uh, real quick, I want to give you a, a cool history thing. Outlaw is a legal term that was originally used to describe a punishment that you would give to someone who was convicted of a crime which is you become an outlaw. You are labeled an outlaw. What that means is c crimes committed against you are not crimes in the eye of the law. You exist out of the law. So Ooh. you are an outlaw. It's a rough punishment. That's a yeah. seriously awful so punishment. So if they come hunting you down, right? there's no punishment for them. If you shoot back, that could be a punishment. It's a real rough punishment. Anyway, that's some Old West history for you. My next card is an outlaw uh, and is possibly going to be one of the uh, go-to two drops in mono red and aggressive like Boros or Gruul aggro kind of decks. And that's Generous Plunderer. Generous Plunderer is a generic in red for a 2-2 human rogue with menace. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may create a treasure token. When you do, target opponent creates a tapped treasure token. When Generous Plunderer attacks, it deals damage to defending player equal to the number of artifacts they control. So... This thing is ramp, right? You play this on turn two and then can play a four drop right? on turn three. And it attacks for three. It's tough to block because it has menace. Mm -hmm. And it comes down as early as turn two. You are giving your opponent a tap treasure token, and that's rough. But if they don't use it immediately, this thing's going to be attacking for four or five uh, in later turns if they don't deal with it immediately. So, you know, it, it does give your opponent the chance to play a turn, let's say, three uh, no witnesses or a turn three, four drop of some kind, mm -hmm. but uh, you also get that advantage, which, you know, I, I, I would take the trade off a good portion of the time. And it says you may, so you may give your opponent an artifact, a, a treasure token. And it also procs off of your opponent's other artifacts they happen to have in play. Yeah. I think this is one of those cards that if the meta goes, I mean, cause there are several things and we've seen several artifacts already previewed in the set. So if there are some artifact-based decks, this card could be really big. I mean, you're talking about just attacking and possibly just dealing four straight up, you know, and it still has Menace on top of it, which is kind of crazy. And we've seen that several other cards that care about you having treasure of your own, and this can just be generating treasure every turn. So this could fit a few different build types, depending on which way the meta goes. It's kind of incredible the value that is packed so tightly in this two mana two two card. The fact that it has evasion and it's letting you get in the head on mana curve, they can catch up. 
but you go first. You know what I mean? Like, so none of that sort of, there's no downside in that regard. You know, I feel like, you know, what, 10, 15 years ago, this would have been at the beginning of their upkeep. You can do this, but they get an untapped treasure first because you got to let them do their thing first or whatever. But no, and nowadays we get all the goodness, all the upside and the evasion. It's a two mana mythic. And I think they did a pretty good job at making it a two mana mythic. Uh, Ruben, what's your last card, which will be your reprint? Uh, I mean, I I went to the card that has seen the least reprinting. Uh, a card that has only ever been printed once. Right. 14, 15 years ago. Jesus. Something like that. Yep. Um, a card that sees a lot of play in every Eternal format, including Vintage. Probably especially Vintage. Mm, especially um, Vintage. And it is a it is a unique effect, and it is called Mind Break Trap. Uh, Mind Break Trap is a two generic and two blue mana counter spell, instant trap. Uh, we're very rarely paying four mana for that, though, because it says if an opponent casts three or more spells this turn, you may pay zero rather than pay this spell's mana cost. Exile any number of target spells. Sheriff Bands Rootin. Is Tootin next? Um, <laughs> this is very popular against Storm. It's very good against Cascade. There's a bunch of reasons why you might want to counter things on the stack uh, that have, you know, especially in the decks like Boros Convoke, even. Mm -hmm. uh, you might reasonably see three spells cast on a turn. So Mindbreak Trap has a lot of uses, hasn't been reprinted since the original Zendikar until this very moment. I have a real question about that artwork, though. Why does it look like it's three pirates just like caught in the bottom of a ship? Like, who, like what's yeah. what's going on? I don't really this? know. It's what's a stuffed going on. jail cell, but they didn't show jail sales anywhere else. It's jail fine. jail sales jail sales. Um, but, but I'm with you. This is this is a good reprint. I mean, this card was going for a pile of money, seventy five dollars. You know. Yeah, just insane. And I, honestly, I don't think it's going to come way down because this is still just an insert in a set full of, I don't know, 150 rares and mythics yeah, or whatever exactly. the hell it's going to be. There's a million so like, mythics. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So it's probably still going to be a lot, but hey, at least you have a chance to open one now, which is pretty cool. Yeah, this is uh, this was the most expensive non-reprinted card until now. Like, it's, I mean, you could, I guess, argue overwhelming forces because it's a P3K card, but sure. like, which is right behind it is a ridiculously expensive card uh, in the set. But yeah, putting this type of money in the set is huge and it, it probably won't go down too far, but there will be a race to the bottom as with all things. It'll probably go, I'm guessing, to 25, 30 bucks. And then you'll start to see that slide all the way back up again because it is on a bonus sheet and a mythic rarity. Yeah, I don't think there's any way around it. Like, it's just going to be so hard to open, but. Like I said, at least we get a shot at opening one. So, I mean, you know, like that's that's exciting for people. And you get to use your wild cards or pay five bucks a copy on Arena, and you can have yep. it there if you need it. Sure. Though I don't think it's necessary right this second, but you know, timeless does exist, and it's only going to get crazier. So, uh, Power Dragon, what's your first card? All right, my first one is kind of interesting. It is also from the uh, big score, whatever, because there's so many damn amazing cards in that subset. But this is Alltech Matter Reaver. It is two colorless and a white for a 2-4 human artificer. Whenever you cast a creature spell, you get to make a 1-1 colorless gnome artifact creature token or create a token that's a copy of an artifact you control. An artifact token. Oh, that's true. Artifact token you control. But, like, this is actually really cool. I mean, oh. just being able to get free value, I think this... This is a type of card that's going to fit a lot of commander decks. Whether you want artifacts entering the battlefield, you need stuff to sacrifice, you need enter the battlefield triggers from creatures, like, and you're getting double triggers in some cases because you cast one creature, then you're making a token that's going to come into play and do it. Or if you just already have some other big creature you want to copy, because there's several things in the set, especially in limited, they're going to be making three three golems. We've seen that text on several cards. Like you're going to be able to do a lot with this thing for three mana. I mean, Novus Inspector makes two clues, right? I mean, yeah, that too. Just <laughs> off the bat. That's the floor. Right, that's sure. the floor. That, that's where you're starting. Right. Like, then, I think that's you great. you get stuff like Mondrak in the picture. You, yep. you know, there's a bunch of ways to make tokens of cards, right? There's usually in blue, but like, you know, copy, like a Phyrexian Metamorph kind of effect or like a, make a, I don't know, Sahili's Expertise, I think was the card. There's mm -hmm. a bunch of ways to, to make tokens and this makes more of them. 
the floor on this card is super high. The ceiling is also real high on this card in a monocolored, easy to cast package. This card's great. I mean, if you think of like the fact that Wizards has leaned in so hard on artifact tokens that do unique things, map tokens, blood tokens, treasure tokens, food tokens, all of that stuff is all over the environment and all over every other format, honestly. Yeah, so, here's a simple four. thought. You could also. have some fun with this with War Leader's Call. Yes. It, every creature is basically two damage now because you get the one coming into play and the one you caught, you created, and it's a 2-2. Two -two. On top mm, of it. Helm of the Host <laughs> says hello. Let's yep. go. Yeah, there you go. All There's right. There's also a card in a big score called Simulacra Synthesizer. I saw that tokens. yesterday. That card's yeah. ridiculous. Uh, all right, what's your second card? My second one, I like. I see this card, and all I can think is I just want to play a green deck where I'm just playing keyword B, where everything is just dumb for the size, for the cost, and has a billion words that do things. Mm -hmm. And this one fits perfectly. It is Bristlebud Farmer. It's a two colorless green green, so four mana for a five five plant druid. Which, by the way, plants might be a real thing in standard in this set now. Nice. I don't know, but it's a five five trampler. When it enters a battlefield, you also get two food for some godforsaken reason. I don't know. You get a five five with trample and two food for four mana. Great. Right. And then whenever you attack, if you want to, you can sacrifice one of those food, mill three cards and put a permanent from them into your hand. Not even a creature, a permanent from them into your hand. Like, this card is awesome. <laughs> like, I can play giant creatures on every turn of the curve if I'm playing green now, and half of them are gonna trample. This is dumb. This is awesome. This, I'm into it. It's sick. You know, green was always the color of like the big dumb idiot. And like, there's it's upside. Plus upside with a little with a little shake of Dude, upside on top. Let me tell you, when I did my review of this card initially, I was like, okay, it's a four mana five five or trample. I guess there's gonna be a downside. And then I read and went, okay, well, I get two food. That's cool. I wonder what the downside is. Oh no, I can just sacrifice food and get more stuff. Never mind, this card's awesome. <laughs> yeah. This is absurd. Uh man, imagine a world where you show this card to anyone. 15 years ago, five years ago. I mean, it's a five, it's a four mana five, five with three upside abilities. That's absurd. Like I had, you know, Blastoderm in my day Dude, and I liked it. I now, had to win tournaments with Ernum Jin. Right. Dude, Ernum, Ernum was such a great example. Ernum was so <laughs> like, sick. This guy it's has the absurd. same cost. He's a it's... bigger power. He tramples. Don't have the downside of giving something for his walk. And I get food on top of it. Yeah, like, even what? if he's doom bladed immediately, I still get something in play. You still get the food. When he attacks, you're basically drawing a card guaranteed. I mean, what's the worst thing you want to do? You get a land, right? Uh, you know, I think you can see, I don't know, maybe you could call it the sins of Chandra, but I think, or Chandra, but it's the sins of Shouldred, where you could really see Shouldred needs answers in every color. Every color right. has something that just hates on and or the creature is so big it's guaranteed to run yep. over them and or trade profitably. If you attack and do the mill thing and get a permanent thing and they block with shoulder, well their shoulder's dead and you're up a card. So that's awesome. You know what I mean? And like yeah. we're see I've seen that uh, in multiple parts throughout the set I think where you've seen cards where you're like, "Oh, that's got five power when you probably would expect it to have less, Hell, but it needs it." Are you up a card? You still have a food left over. Yeah, you still got three <laughs> life hanging out if you need it. I mean, yeah, just too good. Man. If it's you awesome. literally, if you literally play this with your first card, if you play Ultek Matter Weaver on turn three, and then this on turn four, I mean, oh, heck. Oh, come no. on, oh, like, gosh. Yep. and you got three <laughs> foods. I mean, let's go. Like, I mean, it's, seriously, it's not that hard. You just put them together and they go. Uh, what's your last card? All right, this was actually hard for me to decide. So I'm going to give side shout out to Terror of the Peaks because that needed a reprint in that card. Stupid. It's true. Yep. But it's fun that Force of Vigor got reprinted here. Mm. So two colorless, four, four, instant. And when it's not your turn, you can exile a green card from your hand instead of paying its costs. It's an instant. Destroy two target, art, up to two target artifacts or enchantments. The reason I mention this is... I don't know if this means it's going to be reprinted in MH3 or not. Mm. I think it is. I, 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 I would, would assume it, it is. Yeah. yeah, I would assume it is. And we've also seen them do that recently with stuff like doubling season or whatever right. that showed up in back-to-back -back sets or whatever. 
Right. But yeah, this card's just all around useful. It shows up in several formats. It's becoming more played in Commander. Like, just getting a free thing to kind of get you out of trouble to deal with some of the most problematic cards in a lot of formats, totally worth it. Yeah, this is the this is the card I think they, they chose to sort of print twice in Modern Horizons 3 and this one because they were looking for ways to commit crimes in each color. And each oh. co and, and green of all the that colors. Yeah, green of all the colors is actually the hardest one because okay. if you're not, like, fighting them, you're often not targeting anything. You know, maybe sometimes they're graveyard yeah. with the, the yeah, turning something back into or whatever. An right, scavenging you know? news, you know, for example, <laughs> yeah. attacks the graveyard. But this actually targets their stuff. Uh, so I think that's brilliant. Also, again, brings this card early to timeless and historic formats. I'm also very excited about that. Uh, this card is dope. I love it. I'm glad it's here. Also a pricey reprint. People don't realize this was like a $20 card. So like All those elementals are just yeah. bananas. <laughs> so it's good they're getting reprints anyway. Um, and they're being added to Arena. Yeah, we're excited. Um, okay, cool. So let's talk about uh, my three choices here. And what I will kick off with, what I believe currently right now, you know, and Lord knows, Power Dragon will get the chance to tell us, you know, in his in his own, you know, play next week. Uh, I think this is the best rare in the set. and could be the best card in the set if it, if it works out. This little card, the last rare preview. Now, remember, you want to go out on the high note. You know what I'm saying? Just like there's like two cards left from the big, you know, extra mythics or whatever to be revealed. Those are probably going to be pretty awesome cards. Because, y'all, have you read Dust Animus? This card is r ridiculous. I don't even know how stupid. This card is so ridiculous. I can't stand it. It's a white and a generic mana for a 2-3 flying spirit okay we're already well above rate y'all they've yeah. never made a two three two a two mana two three flyer with no drawback before it was like toll making you had to pay two white this is just high okay but we ain't done because of course we're not if you control five or more untapped lands as you cast it it enters the battlefield with two plus one plus one counters and a lifelink counter on it. That's a four, five flying lifelinker for two mana. And you can plot it for a white and a generic mana. And if you don't know, you may pay a white and generic mana and exile this card from your hand, cast it as a sorcery on a later turn without paying its mana cost, plot only as a sorcery. So on turn two, you're plotting it. On turn three, you're ramping with your green because it's probably a white green deck. On turn four, you might plot another one or play that stupid 5-5 five -five thing. And on turn five, or turn four, I guess at this point, you're going to play your fifth land, you're going to drop this four or five flying lifelinker, and your opponent has to somehow deal with that, which you paid nothing for at this point. You invested two mana in this crazy card. This thing seems absolutely bonkers. Having multiples of them hit at the same time, I just, I just, it's just, ugh, yeah. it's a lot. Okay, it's now, a lot. hear me out on this. I think the best thing for this is post sweeper right now, especially with stuff like Sunfall. That right. Means, yeah, the control because decks always get the good aggro go stuff. Turn one, turn two, turn three, body, and you're like, you know what? I don't want to overcommit to the board anymore. I'd say I played like I don't know some creature, some two two, add a line, whatever in my white aggro deck. Yeah. And then you know what? I'm just gonna sit this off to the side, do my attacking. You decide to sunfall. Well, now I play my fifth land, and I'm getting a four five, and now I get to keep fighting, right? With just a two man investment on a turn where I wasn't gonna cast anything anyway. Right. Right. This card, pretty good. Pretty good. Card's so good. Yeah. I, I think that the most likely scenarios here, well, first of all, this card's great in control decks, I think. I think That's that true. this favors this this compares favorably to things like Exalted Angel, which were sort of like ways to dig yourself back out of a lifelink hole. Um playing it just as a two mana two three, that's great. That's good. We we love that for us. Like that right. just stands in front of two twos all day. We plot this on turn four with two mana up with the new quench phantom interference up to counter our opponent's spells. Untap, play it turn, play a land, play it turn five as a four five and say pass with five mana up is also going to be a very common play line. Yeah. This card is extremely good in control. It's very good in aggro. I think that it's you know, anywhere you put this, this is going to be uh, have a strong impact on the game. And I think that uh, for the low cost of two mana, I mean, there's the, there's nowhere that this isn't good. The payoff for the investment, you know, again, even control decks, right? If if it's uh, specifically unlike the uh, the sideboard games, control and control, turn two, this is what you want to plot. You're like, hey, that guy's yeah. just over there, by the way, sure. and he's going to stay over there. And at some point, when we both have seven lands, 
they're just going to, you know, I'm just going to play this thing and you're going to have to do something about it. And I've got all this untapped mana ready to go. So like, this is a classic case of, damn, that's an amazing aggro card. And then you go, oh God, the control decks are going to use it too. You know? And yep. that's amazing. Uh, so I love that card. Let's move on here uh, to my second one, which I think isn't quite as good, but it is very good. And I haven't seen a lot of people talk about it. This card also seems bananas for the plot mechanic. And that is Stingerback Terror. Stingerback Terror is two red, two generic mana for a 7-7 seven, seven rare Scorpion Dragon. First of all, Scorpion Dragon, let's go. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a four mana, but you ain't paying four mana. Not in this economy. Stingerback Terror also gets minus one, minus one for each card in your hand. Very important. We'll talk about that. But you can plot it for red and two generic mana, which again, you set off the side, you play as a sorcery later. All right, so let's do some counting. All right, let's do some math. Math's great. This is a math game, ultimately. You know, turn one, you play the Neo uh, Saga, right? Yeah, so you're down, Yeah, you're down to five five cards in hand. Next, next, next turn, you draw your sixth card. You play a land. You play a two drop that gets the counter, right, from the saga, right? So then you got four cards, all right? Next turn, you draw you up to five. You play your land. You, you, you plot this, right? You're at three cards. Next turn, even if you don't draw a land, if you were to play two spells, this thing is a 5-5 five, five flyer just right off the bat. That you have okay. all of your open mana. You can hit them in the face. You know what I mean? You can have it sort of stay as a 4-4 four, four, and then just instant speed, whatever, play with fire, whatever. Um, yeah, I think this thing is a giant beat stick for a deck that wants to not have a lot of cards in hand. Oh, I don't think you even necessarily need to plot it. I think you could see some mono-red variants or these red-green, you know, playing Audacity and whatever in these cards that are all sure. super cheap, where you're down to like two or three cards in hand anyway on turn four, and you're like, great, here's a four, four, five, five dragons. <laughs> like, I mean, if you plus think, you've got to deal with the other stuff I've got coming at you. Well, like uh, I played the new Pia uh, and the red, white planeswalker yeah. that, that, yeah. you know, gives you, does deal, you gain two and they lose two when you, yeah, stuff Quintorious. Next up. Quintorious, right. So that works perfectly with those guys. You know, there's a lot of payoffs that come into this like giant beat stick that doesn't take a lot to get it to be swinging as a six, six, you know, Smashing your mm -hmm. face next turn, like that's pretty scary in my opinion. Uh, and that so right now out. the the mono red aggro deck. I'm not going to talk about Boros aggro because there isn't really a like a Boros convoke equivalent for this card. Hmm. Um, doesn't really go in that deck. The mono red aggro deck does have a three drop that they use, and it's Godric cloaked yep. leveler. Right. <laughs> so let's compare it to Godric. Right. Godric is a three drop three three with haste, human noble that has celebration. When you have two term permanents come in, it becomes a 4-4 four, four flyer. Right. Compared to plotting this, this compares favorably in some ways and unfavorably in other ways. That's fair. You can lightning strike a Godric, uh, and you can't really lightning strike the Scorpion Dragon pretty any any effectively at all. Mm -hmm. This has haste. Godric has haste. The other one doesn't. Right. It's sort of, it, it, there is a trade-off here of do you value the size to the speed? Ultimately. Well, so how about we're this? always about, having flying as well. How about yes, that's true? How about we four K no lows dose up in here? How about you plot sure. this on turn three? You play Godric on turn four, play this from the plot, trigger okay. Godric, I'm into into four. It. I love that. Well, you got a giant I also like that. That's dragon scorpion good. hanging around. Like that to me sounds awesome. So okay. I'm okay. I'm with telling you, the creatures things. in this set are speaking my language, man. They're doing <laughs> they're doing work. All right. So for my reprint here, I mean it's it's a timeless classic. Y'all look, many, what is becoming many years ago now, uh, the lovely folks at Wizards of the Coast provided me this one Legends booster pack for the uh, Vegas show. Ooh, Remember we went to the Vegas show? Very the live nice, show? yeah. Yeah, this was in like the, the package thing they gave me. So I love them to death, obviously. This is great. And one of the cards the car I'm about to talk about could be in this pack. And not only could it be in this pack, they're reprinting it. Not only is it going to be in this pack, it's going to be in Historic and Timeless. And that means I'm talking about freaking Mana Drain. This card is awesome. First of all, another $50 plus dollar card shoved into the set. High five for two blue mana. If you don't know, two blue Mana Drain is a mythic instant these days. 
counter target spell at the beginning of your next main phase, add an amount of X, I mean, add an amount of colorless mana, actual wingding mana, equal to that spell's mana value. Now, back in the day when the rocks were soft, that was a drawback because you had to say, oh damn, if I don't spend all that mana you just gave me, I get mana burn. These days, it's just upside. It's just literally counterspell with upside. So there's no reason you'd ever play counterspell over this unless you just wanted more counterspells, which means this is now the premier sickest counterspell you're going to get access to in those older formats. Let's go. I also want to point out that, like, this card, I believe, has had seven or eight printings in Paper Magic at this point and is still $50. Like, that sure. tells you how popular this card is, not counting all the variants and foils or whatever. Right. But Commander Legends, Double Masters. That's a lot, man. Like, this that's card, is and people still want it. So this is a very high-value reprint that you can open. This is true. Do we really think that this will stay legal in... I mean, obviously, it'll be in Timeless. Do we think that it'll be legal in any other format online? Like, Maybe. this feels like it's one of those that it's like, we can't actually let, you know, Explorer nope. have this. No, 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 be no, 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 or whatever. no, but think, timeless for sure. Timeless sure. for sure. And that's all it needs to be. You know what I mean? Let me yeah. go play with my big crazy toys, my necropotences and my dark rituals. Right. You know, and uh, we'll go do stupid stuff. I mean, uh, that's, that's a good, and it's also a cool new art for the, um, the outbreak yeah. version. Yeah, I absolutely um, love it. Yeah. Oh, I want to go back for a second because, and I wanted to point this out specifically because I thought it was absolutely brilliant. I don't know who did it, but, you know, Sheriff Bands rooting is tooting next. Yep. Hell it yeah. some epic, epic freaking flavor text. There are some great little jokes, great little callbacks. They've done a really good job. I know that we had the thread like a week or two ago about the guy that's like, it's all tropes and I hate fun. Um, <laughs> oh, I know what dude, I mean? that's exactly why I wanted this set. I yeah, wanted maximum trope. <laughs> yeah, like Honestly, the, we're gonna get we're gonna get Lone Wolf and Cub in the Desert Bloom deck. We're gonna get, like all of the references are my favorite. Look at me, look at me with my beer at the end of the ball. Dude, you know the what fact I'm that about? we got a Roadrunner that has protection from coyotes, and I don't even think there was a coyote in the set. There like, yep. was. No, no, there, there, there was, was one coyote, coyote that, that they put in okay, coyote coyote just one. for that. Yeah, all right. The ley line binding that they put into the set is a dude tied to the railroad tracks. Yeah, like the, the stuff that they did. You know, yeah. all I'm they saying, like shoehorned trains in here. If you, you know, go, if we go through those four commander decks, which have not been spoiled yet, if we go through all of those four commander decks, because we've seen basically the entire, you know, main set, you know, what happened. Yeah. Um, and feel free to correct me if I just didn't see it, but there is not a cowboy hat equipment, correct? Oh, sure. Like, did we really go through all this and not have a cowboy hat equipment? Like, is it is it just me? I was interesting. like, interesting. I just thought that there would it be. It could be I like a even... certain character's hat or something. Sure, it would be cool to have a hat. cowboy hat. Yeah. I mean, they threw in, you know, Jit at home. Like, you know what I'm saying? Hey, like, could we put a deputy in one of the commander decks? That would. Be, can we put the law in there somewhere? That'd be great. Can we have them be? <laughs> They're not gonna, but whatever. Now, as yep. we move out of the first pick, we go to gather the townsfolk. Thanks to our sponsor, Mana Traders, the best tool to enhance your magic online experience. Use the code MagicMikes underscore 8N4, 8 negative 4, for 10% off your next subscription with Mana Traders. Tell them we sent you. <coughs> we appreciate them. They're great. All right. Um, so it turns out uh, the Viashino type is no longer going to be a type. We're going to take all the Viashinos and make them lizards. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's one of those that's ones fine. when I saw people talking about it, I'm like, that's not that big a deal. We've changed a lot of things. You know, hounds became dogs and things like that over the last few years. And like, right. this seems in line with that. Yeah, yeah, I'm not broken up about this. I liked, I like Viashino. I, I am not broken up by all Viashinos becoming something else though. Like, he's, he knows that the Viashino are still flavorfully Viashino. They're right. still a unique race of creatures. That's why that's they're like called that. That's like Leonin being cat warriors. It's right. the yeah. same. It's, it's okay that they're different in that way because it just it just opens the net a little bit. You know, we talked about the creature types from net earlier. Um, that's a whole thing. Are Homrids going to become crabs? Hmm. I mean, where do you draw the line at that hmm. point? You know, I don't know. Actually, I'm maybe. Okay. okay. I'm okay with with Viashino, they, they all look like lizards. Yeah. But do all the homrids, are they all crab? I, the ones I can think of sort of look like crabs. Yeah. I'm I not think sure so. if they're all that way. Uh, and all lobster, pretty much crab lobster people. ish. Now, I, I wouldn't <laughs> oh, that's a good point. 
<laughs> yeah, it's true. Could be lobsters. Uh, and I do appreciate that pharmacist judge noted as we were talking about the, the law on the set. There is a silver deputy that was unveiled. It's a common artifact creature. Still not enough, but I, you know, I do want to point it out. Okay, my bad. I, I missed that. Not there gonna is, lie. There is one in there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I thought that was kind of cool. Um the Arena Championship Roundup. Uh, you were saying, uh, Power Dragon, you uh, broadcasted this. Is that right? Yeah, I was on the broadcast team for that. That was my, I think, fourth Arena Championship I've done. I can't remember. Nice. But I, there's a lot of pandemic stuff where after post-pandemic, I'm like, I don't know, things happen. It's not but right there. yeah, it was it was crazy. One of the things I do want to point out about the events that I think make it worth watching, regardless of what the format is at this point is it's been one like kind of low key one of the harder events to qualify for and i don't think people really realize that hmm. and they are adding more invites and more money actually starting with not this not arena championship 6 but arena championship 7 is going up from 200k to 250k in prize pool and a couple more slots and i think another spot for uh pro tours and stuff like that so even more prizes going into it with more seats well, because of that, one of the things we've seen is some ridiculously high-level play. I think if you want to go back to Magic's Arena channel, re-watch this because, like, there was so much good play. Like, people coming back from being stuck on two or three lands to just, like, win the game on, like, turn six or seven. You know, the last play of the game, or the tournament, actually, it was the best two out of three matches, not even games. And he was in a situation where he kind of had to go for it and found enough cards to get... Another Phoenix in the yard, cast his own spell, counter his own spell to be able to get both Phoenixes into play and gave him like just, I think it was literally enough to win the game. Wow. So crazy stuff going on. That was really fun to watch last weekend. Now, one of the things to note here is that five of the top eight decks were Rakdos Vampires. Uh, is that an issue? I mean, note that almost half the field was Rakdos Vampires. So this isn't super surprising, but the fact that it did so well, regardless of you know, it's clearly on everybody's radar, I think is also kind of concerning. However, there wasn't one in the finals. We had we Quintorius combo mm -hmm. versus, is it Phoenix? Right. So, yep. Numbers seem similar. I'm not, I'm not horrifically worried. I don't think it's worth a ban currently. Not a ban, uh, but uh, Reminds concerning. me of when, you know, occasionally there will be like, oh, the hot new deck, we haven't figured out how to beat it yet. Uh, the big one that comes to me, because I'm an old man, is when Doran was the most popular deck in Old Extended for like a month, and people didn't really know how to answer it. So it was the most popular deck. It was like half the field, 40% of the field, but it like only won. It didn't win above replacement. You know what I mean? It didn't, yeah. it didn't outperform the field. It usually had like a 45% win percentage. Delver is another good example of this, where like the really talented Delver players might win a tournament, but it all overall had a negative win percentage. Feels like we're in that territory right now. We took the field by storm a couple, like a month ago, Manfield took the field by storm and now we're going to catch up to it and figure out how to beat it. Yeah. That was sort of my take all weekend as well. I think some people may have chosen this deck because it's just what they wanted to play. Like they knew it was already proven. They didn't have to do the extra work. Yep. You know, you assume their team had tested against a lot of the other decks. You're like, all right, cool. Even though it has to make a couple of small changes and concessions because of the format versus paper or whatever. But I didn't really think it was that big a deal. And I think each deck is kind of like coming away from this tournament with some other ideas. I will say surprisingly, the I don't know if you want to call it the breakout card of the tournament, but one of the best sideboard cards we saw all weekend was actually Quakebringer. Of Ooh. all things... But it pretty much cold shut off the Amelia combo. Sure. Like, just, just couldn't gain life. Like, you don't have a card in your deck to remove it. Like, if that hit the battlefield, it would just, like, stone nothing. Like, you, you're you just going to die. It that. was yeah, crazy. For, for those who don't recall, uh, from Kaldheim, Quakebringer is a yep. two red, three generic mana, five, four. So it just says, it's a giant berserker. Your opponents can't gain life. And there's a bunch of other words. But honestly, that's all you need. Really? Yeah. You can foretell it for two red and two generic mana? Oh, and it shoots your opponent for two during your upkeep just because. Right. It does. It does <laughs> like, like, it, if it's on the battlefield or if it's in your graveyard and you can yep. a giant. Because if you got one on play and in the graveyard, whatever. You know, get it. You're going to do it both ways. Uh, but regardless, yep. uh, that's awesome. I love that. That's sweet. Um, so moving on here uh, to the magic of Desperate Ravens, where we rant and rave about things. 
Uh, it turns out it took over 30 years or 30 plus years or whatever now uh, to make our way to a one generic and blue 2-2 two -two with no downside. Uh, yep. And it's a salamander. It's a freaking salamander. For for those who don't know, you can look it up in the past. There's always been something just a little, you know, you have to reach for it. Like Plax Manta, you'd have the green mana. Like some of the older ones, uh, even the recent ones, if it was, you know, the target of a spell, you had to sacrifice it uh, as a pirate right. or whatever. Um, you know, all that stuff. But now, not only do you get a two mana, two, two, it's all the upsides because, of course, that's the, the era we live in. For a blue and a generic mana, Archmage's Newt is a rare salamander mount. This is one of the mounts. We haven't really spoken about those. Uh, it's a 2-2, two -two, and whenever Archmage's Newt deals combat damage to a player, target instant or sorcery card in your graveyard, gains flashback until end of turn. That flashback cost is equal to its mana cost. That card gains flashback zero until end of turn. Instead, if Archmage's Newt is saddled, and it has saddle of three, which is kind of like uh, crewing a vehicle, but you can only do it at sorcery speed because they didn't want digital to have like a million stops for every saddle ever prompt that you could have, which is kind of annoying with vehicles. Um, but regardless, again, you can look it up. I know it's wild, but it's 30 years to get here, and yeah. here we are. You know. There's some good three drops to play that can mount up your uh, your newt. I almost put this on my list also, mm. um, you know, and there are some fun things that you can do to give your, you know, like maybe you give your magma opus flashback of zero for the turn. Like there's some hilarious things that you can do on that front as well. The other two twos for two that have been all upside have cost blue, blue uh, in the past. So this is the first time that we've ever seen this. And yeah, I mean, if this is... It, it took us until Desperate Ravings to get to this level of power creep. We talked about the Urnum Jin to 5-5 five, five with all three upsides and like the questing beastification of Magic the Gathering. So that's just the way we're headed, man. Uh, and we're we're trundling always forward towards uh, a future where everybody you know, gets to be a three mana 5-5. Five, five. My issue with the Newt is I'm just not sure, and I'm sure we'll see it, but I'm just not sure right now what the decks look like that want to be tapping a three plus power creature to go with this two two, yeah. and you're playing enough of those creatures that you still have enough quality spells in the graveyard to want to get with the new. You know what I mean? Like it's a, it's probably it's a, a bad a little, card, but yeah, it's a little weird. It's so fine. I don't know. Maybe it doesn't do anything. I, I think, like it'd be interesting to see how that works out. Right. I, I think that that ability kind of sort of reads so over the top because it's so hard to actually trigger that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, for me, I want to compare it with, you know, go, go let's go take a look at go to the time machine. Go back to 2009. Zendikar had Mindless Null, a black and two generic mana 2-2 two, two that can't block unless you control a vampire. That was a three mana 2-2. Two, two, and it actually did see a tiny bit of play. There were people very good, well-known magic players who were saying, sometimes you got to run the null for your curve or you just need a body or whatever. Back in the day, those things happen. And it wasn't until Gutter Skulk and Gate Crash four years later. And that's just a bear. That's just a black and a generic mana tutu. Yeah. That's, that's what it took. It took four years just to get that far in black. And now it's taken this far for a, you know, for a blue card to be all upside. And I mean, hell, I'll take it. Yeah, there's a couple of blue cards. I'm trying to, I'm looking at cards here. Overwhelmed Alchemist mm -hmm. appears to be the best thing that I am seeing to do with the, the Newt in mono blue. Mm -hmm. Three, two for three. When it enters the battlefield, draw a card, discard a card. That's, and then it disturbs and transforms and stuff. Mm -hmm. But that like puts the big sorcery into your graveyard and gives you the saddle guy. So like, I mean, you'd have to play a, couple of pretty not great cards to make this thing work but here, here but, we if are. It but if it hits <laughs> yeah. it works i mean when you're on the train to magical christmas land y'all yeah um we yeah, discard we'll a breach the multiverse i'm happy you know <laughs> yeah we uh you know <sighs> fay dalton um yeah. we had to get here eventually you know we talked about it last week um but things have gotten worse uh in a variety of ways and, uh, and they've gotten to be really unique in terms of the way that Wizards has responded to them. Uh, Faye Dalton, if you don't know, basically got caught red-handed uh, doing uh, tracing, copy-pasting for trouble in pairs. 
But once you see how much of that painting, uh, I would call that collaging at this point. Collaging, yeah. whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Cheated. How, I don't know, you know, like they did not do the artwork themselves. So once that happened, everything else they did was called into question. And it took about I don't know, a couple hours before someone. Yeah, found I was gonna say, I don't even know if it was a full twenty-four hours. Oh no, no, like there's a picture. Like if you literally just Google like picture of lion, one of the first lion pictures that comes up, they had like reversed it, tilted a little bit, and that's the face of the Johnny on the baseball card. And it's like, y'all. Uh, all right, so we all recognize this is terrible, and oh my god, and we're expecting wizards to come out with something to say, hey. You know, this isn't cool. What they did was not all right. The, you know, forgery, you know, copying, whatever. But what I feel has happened here is that there's probably a little bit more legal teeth to what's happened here because the the collaging uh, is so overwhelming. And so it, what happened was Wizards made a statement on a uh, statement on trouble in pairs. And they said, this is the whole thing. We've heard questions on the integrity of the art on the card Trouble in Pairs from the murders at Karlov Manor Commander set, and we had questions too. As we have looked into this further, we're now suspending future work with Faye Dalton. Now, if you look at almost any other statement that's been involved with artists they no longer want to work with, or artists that have been found to do this type of thing, or whatever, there's a little bit more in there. Not a lot, but there's a little bit in terms of like, you know, they did this, or they did that, and we're not going to do it because of so-and-so. This one just says, we had questions, too. And I'm like, you had questions? What questions? And they're not going to list uh, them because I think legal got involved, and here we are. I didn't think it, I didn't really read into that too much. That just almost felt like somebody just took a little bit more of a lighthearted stance with the statement to me. I think, to me, the bigger thing is most of the time you hear, like, well, we're discontinuing work until further notice or something along that lines. And this one, they just said outright, like, nah, we ain't working with this person no more. Like, there's there's no till for future consideration. There's no further notice. We're just done, right? right? So that that to me says, like, hey, we're on the side of, like, there's not even need to go deeper here. We're, we're saying we know outright all of this is bad. There's no recovery from this. Right. I, yeah, it feels like, and because it's also super weird, right? Because they own the copyright of the work that was copied to start with. So that's a whole thing. But, you know, I look back to the older statements on, you know, people like Noah Bradley, for example, and they go pretty far in terms of explaining why they're not cool with their behavior and so on. So I thought that was interesting. I don't think there's any conspiracies behind it, rather than say, like, Wizards, you know, legal probably said, say as little as you can. You know what I mean? Like, we had questions, and we're not working I, with them. I just end. think, and, and I think I've mentioned this before, but it's just, you copied somebody's work mm -hmm. for one of the biggest buyers of artwork you know <laughs> in in the world not even just in the country oh lord right the person who you initially copied has a huge fan base among the consumers of the product of this company you are making the artwork for mm -hmm. right you couldn't have chose like not saying it's ever right but at least previously when we've seen this they went and copied some no-name person on like deviant art or whatever right like you went after somebody who already has a huge fan base. How did you not think somebody was going to notice one of their pieces? Or that they wouldn't notice one of the pieces? Or they wouldn't and remember then, it, right? Yeah, and then we further find out that that whole image has like five different things that are pieced together in it. So you went and copied other people on top of copying this person. And it all made sense, like I said, once I, like... I was wondering why did okay if you're going to copy it why are we leaving the archway in the back like why are we leaving right. the stairwell in the back and then you realize like oh because there's not even an original image that these are patched onto <laughs> like no. this whole thing was assembled yeah and it's like wow that's crazy crazy there was a I don't know if you guys saw this I don't know if this is linked in our show notes but there was a commentary from Je yes for my force uh, on Facebook one of the uh, OGR like, directors. O OGR director, yeah. uh, you know, big name in the industry, right. well respected. Uh, had some commentary on the on on this artist in particular, and uh, didn't have a bunch of commentary on the wider spectrum of it. Basically, said if you do this, you are persona non grata. You're never yeah. coming back. This is the end of, of this person's career. Uh, 
in fantasy and, illustration, no doubt. Yeah, like, I mean, yeah. you can get some Kickstarter projects. You can get some right. small stuff with people, but you're not going to get any of the big name work anymore. Yeah, but you're going to have to, much like the old West, you're going to have to get out of this town. Yeah, this one ain't this one ain't it anymore, buddy. Yeah, so and I again, seen... you went after big name people and copied their stuff. Like that's yeah, going to bring a whole other level yeah. of disrespect with and Donato, consternation. Giancola, like that's a rough one. And now you got to go back to like book covers and you know mm -hmm. whatever you can get commissioned or whatever uh and even then you know again that cloud man it travels for a long time and that and, and i think what's deep. tough is you can tell that that person actually has like artistic skill like it wasn't like this was even necessary not not even necessary to make the style of art that would work for the projects they were trying to do like they're capable I don't That's know if they the are, part. honestly. I don't know if they are. You know what I'm saying? Like, when we've already seen people find other parts of their work sure, sure. that were copy-pasted, modified a little bit, you know I mean? Like, I'm not sure. And that's what sucks, right? This is just, this is the exact same thing that happens with cheaters. You know, Alex Burton Cheney was a good magic player, but also a savage cheater. If he stopped cheating, he would still have been a good magic player. And a lot of them were. I mean, hell, no matter how far it went. So it, it seems similar in that way. But again, such a cloud that goes over everything. Uh, there you are. And yeah. so uh, moving on here, uh, I am absolutely astounded. Now, there have been products that you can only buy for certain time periods, uh, whether it's a couple weeks, whether it's until they run out, you know, whether it's until the secret layer period is over or whatever. Secret layer is the easiest one to, to quantify here. But uh, Warhammer 40K, if you recall, a couple years ago came out, did absolute gangbusters. The, the premium collector deck sold out immediately. They're worth a bajillion dollars immediately. High five. That thing has gone back to print like three or four times i'm talking they just they sell they keep selling they sell great it's an awesome product that's awesome so why why would you restrict this product to only sell on magic online for a whopping 45 days they are taking it off the market i believe this friday on the 5th so if you are listening to this either actively on wednesday evening how you doing uh or later um, and they are not off the store yet. Uh, as a man who lives, breathes, and works in the collectibles, uh, you know, industry, this is about the most obvious. If you want to throw forty bucks or more towards a thing and get value out of it later, here you go. Like you're going to put these cards that are very well liked, have lots of value on the secondary market, which means you know they have value on the Magic Online market, and it's just 40 bucks and if you can get if you can turn your magic online tickets into dollars in some fashion no matter how you do it no matter what the rate is it's going to be difficult to lose that value if you were to try to turn it into dollars later yeah i, mean, I don't know yeah. about the 45 day window if that's a maybe a legal thing or maybe they oh, signed a right? deal to be able to say like hey we just need some amount of time so we can generate some more sales for our other online client blah 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 Maybe they just agreed to like a two month window or something and it gives them time to get it all out there, wrap it up. I have no idea. Listen, I mean, we can go through every magic online story if we want to, but it's just all dingers. It's all home runs this week for magic online. Yeah. Is magic online right? Is, is it online, like starting to Are crush we? It? Is this 2004? Are we? I don't know if I'd go that far, but it's, it's <laughs> not bad. It's not a bad week for them, though. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I it's it's wild. Um, yeah, they're they're doing like a commitment to format parity to try to get you know all these cards sort of you know in the right formats where they're expected to be, uh, particularly legacy and vintage being impacted by commander things. Uh, again, this this to me is just like I'm sure on the license agreement it didn't look quite so weird, but it feels really strange to basically to create a digital reserve list from these cards because that is a little weird. When the hell are they coming back? How are they coming back? But again, it's a good point. Kind of like we talked about in the pre-show. I'm pretty certain we're going to do another command or 40 K set somewhere down the road, probably another year plus from now. But when you do that, then you give a reason to unlock these again. And so, okay, now you can buy all eight decks or whatever it is. And sure. Probably get a run on them because a bunch of those will be worth more right. and more people will buy them because they didn't buy them in the beginning. Yeah, this is uh, this is 
yeah, this is just incredible that, you know, again, it's, it's when you see these types of opportunities, you know, you don't have to take them. It's not a big deal, but if you're in the, you know, if you're into magic online and you've got a collection and hell, you just want to play these cool decks, this is your only chance. And that's wild to say. Um, for something that's just, you know, zeros and ones and license agreements for X dollars or Y percentage or whatever. Uh, and yeah, that's kind of where it ended up. All right, let's uh, move on here. Turn the corner to the finisher. Dwayne the Rock Arena Pet was a big hit at the Arena Championships this past weekend since the event was held on April Fool's Day. And unsurprisingly, <clears throat> he was super solid. And last year's joke, the beat-up sleeves, were also a hit. I still use them this day, by the way. Same. So tell me, what April Fool's arena gag would you pitch for next year, Ruben? Uh, it's, April Fool's is a tough holiday for me because I have a little bit of... I, I can't detect <laughs> any anything in text. Uh, perhaps some of you can relate. However... There are some really fun japes and jokes that can be done. And I think that Arena can do a lot with sound effects. So I'm hoping next year for one day, we replace all of the excellent sound mixing with Mero doing impressions of those sound effects. We're rolling dice. You know what that means. It's time for another game of magic. Dude, Dude, as funny as that would be, I don't know if I could handle that for more than one game. <laughs> Even for 24 hours? You don't think so? Oh, that'd be sweet. Like, okay, side note before I get to my joke, but like, first meeting I had at Wizards where he was actually in the meeting, I remember him speaking and having the intro thought of like, oh, this is his normal voice. Like, I always thought he was projecting because he was on camera and stuff. Yeah. And just like, oh, no, he's just always excited and just talked like this. He really yeah. does. It's been a minute since I've done my marrow impression on the show. So I thought I'd bring it back. Nice. Power Dragon? All right. So we've done sleeves. We've done pets. Mm -hmm. Why not just do a full-on playmat now? So next year, looking forward to the arena adding the most popular magic playboard of all time, the Pokemon Gem. Once upon a time, Wizards Man. of the Coast was in charge of Pokemon. Yep, yep. <clears throat> now, I'm looking forward to a new April Fool's format with decks of 12 cards that last for six 30-second turns, has three lanes and three life totals called Magic the Snappening, and if you win two of the three lanes, you, of course, win your opponent's doubling cubes. Perfect. Yep. Love with it. That Marvel, <laughs> with that Marvel crossover coming. Call out to all our Snapsters. Great game. And that ends another live episode of Magic Mike's. Thanks for joining us here to discuss all things magic. Thank you, Power Dragon. Hey, it's always good to be here. And we'll see how I hold up next week. Because, man, there's all kinds of stuff going on between now and then. Oh, boy. Thank you, Ruben. <laughs> well, it's been a good show. But I think it's time for us to mosey on down the dusty trail. Y'all stay safe out there. Right into the sunset. Move here to our final slide. I want to thank our sponsor, CoolStuffInc.com, our co-sponsor, Mana Traders, my co-host, Power Dragon, and Ruben Bressler. You guys for watching and listening. I hope you support us at patreon.com slash magic mics or promo code magic mics at CoolStuffInc.com. Please follow, like, tweet, favorite, share, subscribe to everything social that tells people we exist. Catch us on our exclusive member Discord live on Twitch.tv at Magic Mics, live or taped on our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter at Magic Mics Cast and join our TikTok at Magic Mics Cast or join us here next week, same time, same place for another episode of Magic Mics. Good night, everybody.